Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel on UCTV and on our mind. And what's on our mind today is uh, more thinking and uh, more strategizing about Alzheimer's disease, more understanding of the problems that Alzheimer's disease raises. With me is Doug Galasco, a professor at UCSD in the Department of Neurosciences, whose special area of expertise is biomarkers. Biomarkers is a way to understand the cause of Alzheimer's disease, the way to track it, and perhaps in the future, the way to decide whether our therapies are actually working. So Doug, welcome, and tell us about you, and tell us about this thing called biomarkers. Um, so I, I'm a neurologist and um, I've been interested in the brain and aging and things that um, can be successful and can go wrong during the process and a lot of that got me interested in Alzheimer's disease and one of the um, gaps when I started was a way to try and take some of the very exciting discoveries about pathways, mechanisms, abnormal proteins that um, related to Alzheimer's and figure out, can we measure some of these things in actual patients? And so that would be an example of um, a crossover into a biomarker. So thinking outside Alzheimer's disease, um, when a lot of us go to see a physician for an annual checkup, we'll have a cholesterol level measured. Mm -hmm. So cholesterol is something where we'll get a number out of a test and that number is used to help to assess risk and maybe to have an impact on treatment. For Alzheimer's disease, we're dealing with the brain. The brain is a lot more complicated than almost, well, than any other organ in the body. And so I think we're not going to be able to take a single test and a single number and say, this is everything we need to know about the brain. Um, but how do we start? And what are some of the things that we might want to do to um, bring testing into a place where it's going to help us to make decisions? Good, and so are there clues that come from the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, from the clinical course that's followed that can help us with biomarkers? So th there are many, many clues, and there are lots of different approaches to try and discover biomarkers. One of the areas I've been extremely interested in is looking for protein biomarkers um, that might be detectable either in the blood or in the cerebrospinal fluid. A blood test would be terrific. Um, unfortunately, the brain is shuttered off from the bloodstream by um, barriers, and anything that is made in the brain, if it maybe gets into the blood, would be diluted enormously. So unfortunately, so far, a blood-based biomarker has been elusive. Um, so I've focused, as, as of many other people, on cerebrospinal fluid. Um, this is the fluid that bathes the brain. It relates in many ways to the chemistry of the brain, and we can sample it by doing a lumbar puncture, inserting a needle into somebody's lower back and removing a little fluid. Um, it's more invasive than drawing blood, but it's not an extremely invasive procedure. It's been done for many, many years quite safely. So what can we learn by examining cerebrospinal fluid? One thing um, that we could do is to imagine that we know something about the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. There are plaques and tangles. Are those reflected in any way in the cerebrospinal fluid? So let's go a little further. Plaques are made of a protein called amyloid or amyloid beta protein, and there are different fractions and lengths of amyloid beta protein. Can we detect those in spinal fluid? Um, the answer, as we found out about 30 years ago, is yes. Um, after a lot of work to try and improve how we detect them, we found that there were diagnostic patterns of um, different lengths of these amyloid peptides in the spinal fluid that told us about what could be going on in the brain. And to fast forward now, we know that the level of a protein called A-beta-42 is decreased in people who have an amyloid buildup in their brain. And this, this decrease can help us in diagnosis of someone with symptomatic Alzheimer's, but it actually maybe begins years before somebody develops Alzheimer's. So we could use it as a predictive test in that situation. The other pathology in Alzheimer's that um, Professor Alzheimer recognized is the tangle. Again, with um, 
A lot of research into what goes into tangles led to the discovery that they consist of a protein called tau. Something goes wrong with tau and it misfolds and forms aggregates in tangles. We can't detect tangles in CSF, but in fact we can detect fragments of tau. And again, these are diagnostically altered in Alzheimer's disease. So over the last 25 years, um, a diagnostic test in CSF looking at a beta 42 tau and a phosphorylated form of tau has been developed. Um, it's taken a lot of work and a lot of work to actually refine it and get it to a point where it might be well standardized and usable. So this would be an example of one of the first CSF biomarkers that, that we could measure. Doug, I mean, it seems to me that um, even in CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, you're still not in the brain. So what about tools that we can use now to look at the brain and what's going to happen in the future? Are we going to have even better methods to measure brain function before folks complain of memory loss? Oh, absolutely. So CSF is like a swimming pool that surrounds the brain and you can imagine measuring something in a swimming pool. Um, it'll give you an overall sense of the swimming pool, but it won't tell you anything about the deep end and the shallow end and the fine detail. So can we take good pictures of the brain and can we use those to develop biomarkers? The answer there again is yes. Um, and the brain is complicated. So again, we need to decide on what it is we'd like to measure. We know that the brain progressively shrinks, undergoes atrophy in Alzheimer's disease. Um, the very first ways to get pictures of the brain used CAT scans and um, researchers started out looking at CAT scans using a ruler and measuring um, cross sections across CAT scans to be able to show that they could get a rough measure of atrophy. Um, fast forward to the age of MRI technology and we have some remarkable ways of getting incredibly precise pictures of how big the whole brain fractions of the brain, areas of the brain are using MRI. We can do tests to try and activate parts of the brain in response to cognition. And these have been very sensitive at showing early changes once people have symptoms. Um, so those would be some of the tools to investigate structure. We'd also like to investigate chemistry. And so CSF again is the swimming pool chemistry. It may have a number of different uses, but it's not going to be a picture of the brain. Um, so can we get a picture of plaques, for example? Um, the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> groundbreaking research, again, these things don't happen overnight, um, but groundbreaking research led to a compound being developed that could be used to inject into the blood, gets into the brain, and sticks to plaques, and we could then take a picture using a PET scan. Um, the first of these compounds was developed at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, there are four others that are now rapidly evolving into um, more regular use. And these give us an idea of the burden of amyloid in the brain. And that's the burden of this amyloid beta peptide. This amyloid right? beta peptide that is stuck together mm -hmm. and formed plaques. Mm -hmm. And it gives us one picture of what's going on in Alzheimer's disease. So for example, if we had a treatment that was aimed at preventing the buildup of plaques, preventing the enlargement, or maybe even removing plaques. We could use amyloid imaging to get an idea of how the treatment was working in response to the plaque burden. So how about the other pathology that Professor Alzheimer's saw way back over a century ago, um, the tangle? Very recently, people have come up with small molecules that, again, can be labeled, get into the brain, and stick briefly to tangles. And this has led to the ability to perform tau imaging. Um, the first studies have only come out within the last 18 months, but already this looks like a very exciting way to figure out where in the brain tangles begin, how they might spread to different parts of the brain, and how the presence of tangles might relate to the presence of symptoms. Um, so all of that will be very helpful to develop a good map of tangles in the brain. We can imagine then looking at tangles as a way to um, measure treatment outcome because tangles correlate more strongly than plaques with how severe dementia is. So a treatment that targets tangles, for example, 
um, might be able to um, show a decreased burden of tangles if one did amyloid, um, if one did tau imaging at the beginning and the end of a clinical trial. And going forward, um, even these markers are pretty late in the evolution of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, looking forward, what do you see over the horizon for even more effective uh, biomarkers to predict someone uh, with memory problems in the next decade or so? Is, where are we with that? So that's a wonderful question. And we're at a number of different levels of addressing it. Firstly, we would like to have a cheap screening test to be able to make a prediction. I don't think we would want to line up everybody at age 60 or 65 and do an amyloid scan and a tau scan. Um, this would be incredibly expensive. It would be nice to be able to have a blood test or some other type of test to give us some idea of who is at greatest risk. It may be that by doing a number of different things, um, some genetic profiling, risk factor assessment through questionnaires, um, some very clever kinds of memory and cognitive testing, that we can identify people who might be at slightly higher risk. Maybe a blood test will help to stratify that risk further. And then we could decide on what comes next. Um, so something that's been looked at recently is an eye test where people have a technology that may be able to identify plaques that um, could develop in the retina early on in the course of Alzheimer's disease. This is going to need a lot more work and validation, but it's an example of a type of technology that would be more affordable and might pave a way to the future. Very exciting. Doug, where do people find out more about these biomarkers? Um, there are lots of sources of information. At UCSD, much of our research is summarized on the website for the Shiny Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And so you can go to adrc.ucsd.edu. And there are descriptions of some of the ongoing biomarker and therapeutic studies, um, as well as links to other sources of information. Very helpful. Doug, thanks for being with me. And this is Bill Mobley for On Our Mind. <laughs>